Hi everyone, welcome to our Saturday session of our Intelsat Space STEM program. And today we are joined by Colin Mamdu, and Colin is going to take us through power. Uh, we've got the power, I got the power. And uh, so without any more, let me uh, hand over to Colin. Colin, thank you so very much uh, for putting together today's session. And uh, I'm really intrigued. <laughs> you know, I thought I remembered everything that I'd learned, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell people how long ago it was that I was at university and did this for the last time, most recently. So, uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to hand over to you, Colin, please. Uh, okay. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Judy. And uh, yeah, welcome to, to everybody on a, on a fine Saturday morning uh, down here in the Western Cape. We're busy preparing for a very, very big cycle race tomorrow. Uh, and, and I think Judy, around your part, you're going to have a lot of visitors uh, whizzing by ultimately. Um, but I think uh, sadly for them, it's going to be a cold and rainy day uh, from what I see uh, on the current side. So I hope uh, whichever part of the world uh, you're coming in from, uh, you know, you have great weather and you're all uh, healthy uh, this morning. So, so maybe just uh, from my perspective, uh, just a quick introduction to, to who am I and, uh, you know, what am I doing here um, ultimately with yourselves? But I've got a very, very long, long history, uh, way, way back. Uh, I've got a background in uh, electronics engineering. Um, and I had uh, an absolute love for the field for a, for a very, very early time. Um, I then went on through my career, having done a whole range of different IT uh, related courses, et cetera, and certifications. Uh, I then moved on to a, a master's in business administration. And, uh, you know, so dabbled in the business world a little bit and helping uh, various different organizations, et cetera. Uh, in my current role, I, I work for a large uh, telecommunications company where we assist our customers with uh, digital transformation. Uh, and I'm sure it's a, it's a buzzword that a lot of you might, might be familiar with. It's very closely related to IoT and exactly what uh, G and the team are ultimately doing here and exposing you to. Um, so this is absolutely a, a massive career opportunity for, for everybody. Um, and then, of course, I'm, I'm also just currently completing a, a PhD, um, and, and essentially, um, I'm sort of relating the IoT world, utilizing that with some of data, and the whole aim of the research is to show a correlation between um, air quality, uh, particularly in the lower LSM type areas, and its impact to, to TB, right? So I think that um, although a lot in the medical fraternity understand that there is a link, but there isn't any uh, past re research that actually shows that ultimately. So as you can see, I'm leveraging off my experience from the IoT world uh, and help that to sort of create new content and new research proving um, and, and uh, you know, proving air quality impact on health. So a direct impact on, on society ultimately. So, um, you know, after all of that said, I have to say that uh, I was chatting with Judy just earlier on onto the call that this is one of my favorite uh, subjects. You know, I, I never get tired of talking about this and chatting with uh, my other co-host and colleagues, um, Nico and, uh, and Brittany as well, uh, you know, quickly talking about some of the, the theories in there. So, so very glad that my colleagues are on this call as well, and certainly they will be providing some input as we as we go along. Um, and then of course I'd like to I'd like the session to be very, very interactive. So please uh, you know raise hands, ask questions. If I could just ask my co-hosts to assist me, I'm not able to monitor the screen. So please at, at any point just shout out. Um, and um, and yeah, let's have an awesome session uh, learning about power. So I'm quickly gonna share my screen. Uh, if you give me a second. Colin, while you, Colin, while you do that, um, Milena, Nico, and Brittany are all co-hosts with you. So, yeah, you have a lot of support, a lot of scaffolding for your session. Excellent. Thank you for that. Let's uh, just quickly get this up. All right. Um, just to confirm, do we see the agenda? Yes, we do. 
Okay, excellent. Um, so folks, we're gonna, it's quite a, quite a number of, of elements and discussion points that uh, we'd like to get through in a very short space of time. Um, but you know, certainly where this conversation happening, we were not necessarily going to halt it uh, or limit it. The idea is to interact as much as possible. But very quickly running through some of the theory uh, elements uh, behind power and electricity, what are the various different um, components that make up an electrical circuit, sources of power, how power is generated. Uh, we're also then going to relate that into satellite technology and give you some sort of exposure uh, into, into how satellites operate and where they get their power from. Um, and there might be an interesting um, question that I might answer for a lot of you uh, in terms of why, why do these um, max IQ blocks look the way they do, right? And uh, we'll give you some, some sort of uh, um, theory behind uh, why that is the case. We'll cover a little bit about um, circuit theory and uh, maybe towards the end of the session, chat a little bit about uh, habitat on Mars and how some of these topics relate to, to that environment. Um, and we have a number of questions as well as an assignment uh, at the end of this. Um, so perhaps then just jumping straight into electrical theory. So I think it, it's, it's quite an important aspect to get an understanding for, you know, what happens every time you pick up your, your cell phone or um, currently a lot of you are looking at your laptops as it stands, right? Um, but interestingly, the, that capability of us utilizing technology comes from a very, very microscopic world, right? It goes all the way down to the way um, to the atomic layer and, and how atoms ultimately are, are formed, etc. cetera. Um, so essentially, as we all know, the uh, various different particles are made up of, of different types of atomic structures, right? So you have uh, different materials uh, and the way materials look and feel and the way they behave is very heavily determined on the uh, atomic layer and how these, uh, these atoms um, uh, work with each other, how these atoms are packaged uh, and, and, and how they sort of almost communicate all ultimately with each other. Um, so a lot of you might uh, recognize this picture at the very um, core of an atom is, uh, is ultimately a nucleus, okay? And within the core, as a lot of you would know, uh, there are protons and neutrons that exist within that, that, that world. And then spinning around in orbits, uh, in very structured um, orbits, we have a range of uh, electrons, right? And um, some of you also might know that there's a very, very specific pattern in terms of how these electrons spin around um, the, the nucleus ultimately. But what happens at the very edge of, uh, of these orbits is an interesting phenomenon called valency, right? So you have a, a, an electron or, 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 or um, a few others that are spinning around that have the ability to jump from one atom onto another, okay? And this movement of the electron is what we term as valency, all right? Um, so ultimately, you'll find that, take for example, a typical conductor, all right? Um, a conductor is essentially a material that we know carries electricity, right? It's got the capability of conducting um, electricity from one side to the other. And what happens is that when you provide power to the one side, you then start to, to stimulate the very first atom, which then gets the valence electron from the outside of that atom to hop onto the next one. And a chain reaction almost occurs where you have these electrons starting to move along this entire chain. Um, but of course, for this, this movement to happen, we need to have this in a closed loop environment. So you almost ultimately need to have some type of energy source talking to, an, uh, to a conductor, and the other side of the conductor needs to come back into the energy source. So you have a nice closed loop, which basically allows the electrons now to hop on from one side to the other. Um, Interestingly, on the other side of a conductor, you have what's called an insulator, okay? So insulators uh, do kind of the opposite to what a conductor does. Um, and the, again, it relates back to the structure of the atoms within an insulator. So with the insulators don't 
actually have um, valence electrons that are have the ability to move from one side to the other. So very first uh, quick question to everyone uh, on the call, um, you know, can you sort of give me any ideas of uh, examples of conductors first? And you happy? I'm happy if you just unmute and just uh, just call it out. Miriam and um, Adiola have said metals, and most metals, and Tofaria has said copper in the chat. Excellent, uh, fantastic. Those are those are absolutely uh, you know, excellent conductors, uh, and you'll find that uh, you know in the metallic range. Um, copper is, is ultimately preferred as, as one of the better, better conductors. Um, Declan, you've got your hand up. I've heard before that gold and copper together are two very good conductors, especially gold. But of course, because of its price, you can't use it as well as copper. That's, that's a great, uh, great point indeed. Yeah, it'll be interesting having... Uh, gold plated well so i think what's what they've actually managed to do declan specifically around around that um is you'll find that gold is actually utilized inside microchips because it's such a small quantity as well uh, and they do have certain uh, um, certain processing chips that make use of of gold um judy yes hi colin uh, i'm thinking maybe what i should do is let me just maybe pin my camera um so that people can see me um so what i'm doing is i'm holding up i'm holding up one of my flight stations uh with the same chips and this one here at the top in the middle is a black chip this is actually a space gray chip and what we do with these is because they're going into space and they're going to be exposed to a variable a huge as they call it, thermocycling. So when it's in the sun, uh, it can get very hot. When it's in the shade, it can get very cold. Um, and so what we do is instead of having copper lanes here in the PCB, we actually have gold lanes because gold has got a much lower expansion coefficient with temperature. Copper, copper can get very hot, um, and uh, and what it does is it has it has more it has a slightly higher expansion coefficient. So um, which which could uh, with a lot of the cycling it could actually create uh, quite a lot of uh, degradation of the of the circuit. Um, also, the one of the reasons why gold is used is because you know gold is a is a noble metal because it doesn't um, it doesn't oxidize very easily at all. Um, gold and platinum don't, don't oxidize very easily, whereas copper will oxidize. You know, that's why copper goes green. Um, it's because of the copper oxide. Um, and the, the oxide itself can sometimes be an insulator. So, you know, it, it kind of defines, it, 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 uh, it defies the, the whole um, rationale for it. So I just wanted to give an example of where we would use gold instead of copper. Um, and Colin, as you said, such, such, such low volumes that it, it's not because of the price, because the absolute value of the gold is nothing compared to the cost of a launch or the cost of replacing uh, electronics in, in motor vehicles, aeroplanes and things like that. Excellent. Thanks for that, uh, that background, Judy. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, similarly, so you'll find from an insulator perspective, um, uh, various things like wood, uh, plastic, um, um, cloth, materials, etc., uh, are considered uh, insulators, right? So there are obviously um, times when um, insulators are useful. Um, if you think about um, appliances, for example, that plug into the power outlets, if those um, internal copper cables were exposed and you touched it, it wouldn't be a very pleasant experience. Um, so what you find wrapped around that are ultimately insulators. Uh, it is basically prevents you uh, from conducting um, power from, uh, from the actual outlet itself. Um, 
So we'll find that, you know, within each, as we go into the circuit theory, et cetera, um, there are at least three elements that I'd like to cover with yourself. So firstly, we have this, this concept of voltage. Sorry, um, Colin. Sorry, yeah. Colin, just hang on a second. It, it seems to have gone into some kind of a, a presenter mode rather than just a normal display mode. Let's see. Uh, let's just see if I can uh, fix that. Thank you, Judy. Sorry. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Excellent. So, um, so ultimately, from a voltage perspective, um, voltage is what is required to get these um, electrons moving around. So some of the names that you might actually uh, hear utilized would be uh, EMF or electromotive force, um, or sometimes even potential difference, right? So but, um, voltage uh, also relates to what amount of power is really available to get things moving along. Uh, you'll find the unit that we use for voltage is the little V, uh, and it's uh, named after a famous scientist uh, called Voltaire. Right, as you would find with most of the different um, concepts we're going to cover in the circuit theory, it's going to be named after some famous um, scientist ultimately. In terms of um, um, voltages and sources of, of voltages, uh, a lot of you are familiar with uh, with batteries and different types of batteries. Um, you know, so we I've actually got a few of these up here. So um, some of you would recognize this as a double A battery, uh, for example. And we know that it has a storage capacity of 1.5 volts, right? So 1.5 V. Um, then we have a little one like this, uh, also known as a button cell battery uh, or a CR2032. Um, and this has a capability of storing around about three volts, okay, on, onto it. Um, and then uh, there's another little interesting battery here that um, a lot of us actually find in and remote controls uh, and, and, and don't let its size put you off. I mean, this little battery here um, actually has 12 volts, uh, you know, ultimately. And you'll find that uh, um, you also have a 12 volt battery found in most cars um, as well. But obviously, you know, with the car batteries, they're quite large. Um, so um, maybe just uh, jumping into a quick poll, um, Judy, um, I'd like to ask the question around having various um, types of batteries, we know that um, a lot of you have seen these being connected uh, in series like this, and series is sort of one connected to the other. And then there are also times when these batteries need to be connected in parallel, right? So if you wouldn't mind just hopping onto the poll, thanks to you, that's currently up, which uh, asks two, two very quick questions. What happens when you connect, if this is a 1.5 volt battery, and we connect a second battery in parallel to it, what happens to, to the voltage? Um, you know, does it decrease? As I said, same, does it increase? And then with um, the second question basically asks, if we now connect them like this, almost back to back in series, does the voltage increase, decrease, or stay the same? Um, so we'll give you a couple of, uh, of seconds there, as so we currently up around about three people um, have responded so far. We've got five people out of 17. Eight people. Okay, so we've got around about 10 people that have responded. Um, so in terms of, um, of the 10, um, for the first question in terms of connecting them in parallel, the majority of you feel that it stays the same. Um, and then some of you uh, feel that it decreases. 
Um, and then for the second question, when what happens if we connect them in series, um, we see the majority of you selecting increases the voltage. Some of you say um, it decreases, and then some of you then say that it uh, stays the same. All right, so very, very quickly, I'm going to, and thanks for, um, for that. Uh, I am going to quickly stop my camera and quickly do a swing around. I want to confirm that everyone can see this little orange uh, device and I'm going to switch it on. Okay. Colin, yes, we can see it perfectly. Okay, excellent stuff. Thanks, Judy. Um, so what we're going to do first is I'm going to take, uh, let's see if I can get it right. So I've got the battery down here. Um, and I'm going to measure the voltage across the battery. Okay, so you can see this particular battery is uh, around about 1.5 volts, which is what we, what we expect. All right, so now let's try and connect them up in series. Okay, so I think the majority of you answered that if we connect them up in series, it's going to increase. Um, let's see what happens. Okay, that's interesting. We get around about 3.04 volts. Um, that, that basically increased the voltage, okay? Um, and just while I'm setting up the, the next one, if you could think about um, how is that value determined, right? When we connect our batteries in series, how do we end up with going from 1.5 to, to 3 volts? Um, so if somebody could think about that aspect, and I'm gonna try and get the parallel uh, battery a bit uh, tricky, but let's see if we're able to pull it off. Yep, this is very, very tricky. Um, Colin, maybe if you have a battery holder, like a, a, a series battery holder, maybe like a torch or something, if it, or, you know, sometimes like whatever, um, yeah, but then you don't know if it's really in parallel or series, do you? That's true. Yeah, but that's fine. Really it um, it's, it's currently reading, I think it's 1.4 is what's showing up on the meter. All right, excellent. You so, can use paper clips to connect them in parallel. Paper clips. Oh, yes, of course. Paper clips would have been a, would have been a great option. Uh, thanks for that, folks. So, so essentially, what we did there, and, and for me, you know, I prefer to see empirically what's what's happening um, with these batteries, right? Um, when we connected them in series, we measured 3.0 something volts across the two. But when we measured them in parallel, we measured around about 1.4 volts. Would anybody like to um, just quickly chat about it or discuss those two options and those two results? And, Give us your summary in terms of what do you think happens uh, when batteries are in parallel versus uh, in series. Uh, Tafara. So as we observed in series, it increases in parallel, it decreases if I'm not mistaken. In, in in series, you say it uh, it increases in parallel, it decreased. Yes. Um, okay. All right. Uh, anybody else would like to sort of add on to that? Um, in the chat, Riza said it is because the charge from the circuit moves twice through the same voltage, which is one point five volts. Uh, the total would be three volts, but the flow remains the same. That's what Riza said in the chat. Thanks, Brittany and, and the rest of for that. Um, let's just see who else. Okay, I see a comment here from uh, Ruby. Ruby says voltage to parallel stays the same, current and resistance is what changes. Um, No, that's 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 totally correct, uh, and and I think you you know um, so Judy made a comment that the decrease of power was too small to be considered because, um, you know, I was basically trying to fiddle around with uh, with getting the probes to touch both both ends. Um, Carrot, Karine. 
Hi, Colin. Hi, Karine. Yo, please go ahead. Um, I th um, think that um, the total current in series increased because um, the path in which the electric the electricity was going through, it was only going through in one path, but in the parallel decreases because there was different branch branches in which the electricity was traveling in. That's what I think. That's a great explanation. Thanks, uh, thanks, Karim. Um, Declan? Yes, sorry. Um, uh, would, wouldn't the, the, it be better to conduct the experiment in a simulated environment rather because the, the series one with the experiment where we put it in series, it makes sense that it would increase. But unless we have two batteries of the exact same voltage where there's always going to be that variation, I think it would have been better to conduct that in um, parallel to determine a better uh, conclusion. And, and correct. I mean, you know, from a scientific uh, um, uh, method perspective, uh, Declan, absolutely. We would need to carry out a few more different types of, of experiments to have a conclusive result. Uh, I think next was, uh, I think it was Megan, perhaps. Yes, hi, Colin. Um, I just had a question. When connecting the um, the batteries in parallel, wouldn't that make the voltage stay the same and not necessarily decrease? Correct. Uh, so very well spotted, Megan. I noticed that. Uh, also noticed that a few of you were were, were talking about the voltage decreasing. Um, so so yeah. Look, the, the the first thing that I think when we conduct a lot of these experiments. Um, we're working in non-ideal um, circumstances, right? So, so basically, for example, I'm not even sure these two batteries are, are brand new. Uh, they might be sort of uh, utilized uh, to a certain extent. Um, the meter that I'm using, so you'll find that when you're working um, a lot with electronics, etc., this is a very, very primary tool that, that anybody would need to have uh, in their arsenal. Um, and this is a tool that's utilized for measuring voltage, um, current, uh, resistance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the probes that they use as well are not, not necessarily the best grade as well, right? So we can expect some, some level of tolerance and, and differences, et cetera, from that, that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, just to very quickly um, summarize what a lot of you seem to, to, to understand um, ultimately from this is that, um, correct, from a, from a um, a series perspective, you typically add the two voltages together of, of the batteries that you have uh, in series. So for example, if we then took a third battery and added it in series to the first two, uh, two batteries, we should expect to see a voltage around about 4.5 volts, okay? Um, and again, in a perfect world, we won't necessarily see exactly 4.5000. It might be something very, very close to that ultimately. But when we look at it in parallel, if we take a 1.5 volt battery and we connect it in parallel to another battery, we can expect to see the same 1.5 volts um, coming across from both batteries. If we now connect three, four, five, ten 10 batteries in parallel, okay, we will still continue to measure um, exactly 1.5 volts ultimately. Okay, so the question is then, why would we why would we want to do that, right? I mean, where, where, what sort of applications would we have for batteries in parallel versus batteries in series, et cetera? Um, so to answer that question, I think when we get to the circuit theory elements, uh, I'll sort of uh, delve into that a little bit deeper. But I think for now, I just quickly want to run into the other thing that we, we understand from circuit theory is once we have voltage applied to, to a circuit, there's a flow of electrons and the electrons basically move from the positive terminal um, of the battery or the power source through to the negative terminal, okay? And this flow of electrons is called current, okay? Um, and you'll find that the SI unit uh, for current, um, also named after a very famous uh, physicist, um, and is the ampere, okay? And it's typically the capital letter A. 
Now, um, essentially for um, the, the current flow, we'll find that current typically flows or takes two types of forms, right? So we'll have a DC uh, form of current and we'll also have AC current. Um, now, if we, for example, had to look at this, uh, what does direct current look like on a, uh, on a graph? I'm going to just quickly attempt to, to draw this to see if this works. And if you all wouldn't mind excusing my terrible, terrible handwriting. Um, back when I was in primary school, I was actually sent to the principal's office for having horrible, horrible handwriting. So if any of you share the same issue as myself, go ahead and, and, and like so that I know I'm not alone. Um, so ultimately, if we have a graph that looks like this with time in that direction, and we have, um, uh, let's call that uh, voltage in that direction. And if we have, say for example, a five volt supply coming in, direct current would basically look that should be a straight line, okay? Um, what that simply means is that it's flowing in one direction and one direction only, and it is fairly constant, right? Um, so the voltage measured at time zero or at time 10 or at time 20 will always continue to be five volts, assuming that the battery supply is, is, is healthy um, and fully connected, all right? And this is something that we refer to as DC. From an AC perspective, okay, AC would look something like this. And I'll use an example that a lot of you might be familiar with is the, the supply at home, right? Your supply coming into um, your power outlets is around about 220 volts, right? And what you might not know, but uh, is that it actually looks like this, okay? Um, the current at any point in time is different, okay? And in effect, it is alternating, okay? And therefore we refer to power here as alternating current uh, coming through the power supply there and um, power coming out of batteries are typically DC, okay? And now if you, if some of you are sort of um, look back into history around uh, the time of, of Tesla and, and Volt, Voltaire and Ampere during their time, there was a really, really big conflict between AC and DC, okay? Conflict in the sense that you had these massive power stations that needed to produce power and deliver power to, to households, okay? And there were a few people that believed that DC was the way to go. Let's go and deliver direct current to households. And there was another group of people that basically believed that AC was the way to go, okay? Um, and I think my, my co-host, Melina, has a sense of where I'm going with this. So maybe Melina, I'd like to bring you in here. Um, yes. So in the beginning of the 20th century, um, Alex Edison and uh, Tesla were living in New York. And the first power stations were direct current power stations that would, would supply power uh, two kilometers uh, around the power station in New York that was built by Edison. And when Tesla invented or rather discovered the alternating current, there was a huge um, fight of whose power stations are going to win to power New York. And then Tesla could uh, power houses that were much more than two kilometers away from the power station. And that's how the alternating current uh, uh, won the fight for power in houses. And that was around New York. Then Tesla discovered the um, Tesla Tower where he was um, uh, powering uh, or sending power in a distance without human connection and so on, the rest is history. Fantastic, thanks for that, uh, Milena, for that quick uh, history lesson. And uh, I think, yes, ultimately we know who won. It was basically AC. Um, and the reason for that was when we're looking at power efficiencies of transmitting uh, power over long and large distances, um, alternating current, um, it has a higher efficiency of being transmitted without power loss along the way when compared to, to DC, okay? Um, 
Okay, so then the other elements that um, that we need to consider within any particular circuit it would be resistance, right? So ultimately, resistance is the opposition to the flow of current. Okay, so there are there are times when we need to 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 slow re, um, 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 the current down a little bit. So by way of example, um, if I, if you have a um, a little LED, okay, so an LED is a little component like this. Um, and this little guy can only tolerate, it's an LED which basically sends the light emitted diode. He can only tolerate up to around about three, three volts. Um, and anything more than that um, is going to is going to pop it. Okay, so you would need to have a little component called a resistor. Um, this is really tiny, but I hope you Sorry, can see Colin, that. maybe if you stop sharing your screen, sorry, then we can see your oh, camera. Sorry, yes. oh, sorry, yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah, that's a lot better. Um, so the LED essentially is that little guy. Um, and then, of course, the resistor is something that looks like this. Okay, it's a really tiny component. It's got uh, colored bands on it um, ultimately. But what that does is that it, um, it basically resists um, the flow of, of current. Okay, and I'm going to show you um, where that's useful and, and why it is useful ultimately. Uh, let's just quickly get uh, to this. Yeah. Um, so the resistor in terms of, um, um, I know that we've been talking about symbols on, on the circuits, I'm going to cover that uh, coming up, but what are some of the various different factors that uh, would affect uh, resistance? So things like length, right? So especially as we spoke about during the wars of DC versus AC, transmitting um, um, power over large uh, distances um, ultimately introduced a lot of resistance um, in, in, in the circuit and therefore there was a lot of power that was ultimately being lost. Um, then if you looked at the area of, of, the, of the element itself. So let's say for example, a typical uh, conductor like copper, okay? If we have a very, very thin, um, thin strand of copper, okay, versus a very, very thick um, um, collection of, of copper strands, right? Obviously, the thin one has a very, very small, um, small area in terms of, a, of diameter. And then you have the large uh, pipe, ultimately, which is a far thicker uh, piece of pipe. Um, so you'll find that typically the one with the thinner or the smaller area has a greater resistance when compared to the larger area, right? So ultimately the large area just allows more electrons to flow at the same time, therefore basically reducing, um, reducing the resistance. Of course, things like uh, the type of material um, are, 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 will also have an impact on resistance. Uh, you would have heard a comment from Declan as well as Judy around gold is also sometimes a very good um, adapter as well. Um, you have different types of alloys, which might be combinations of, um, of tin uh, on copper, for example. Um, and then, of course, we know that there are certain types of materials that are just poor, poor conductors, um, ultimately. The last element is also temperature, right? So temperature has uh, has an impact on the resistance of the circuits. Um, Judy sort of cited a very nice example about as you find these conductors moving to space, etc. Um, they have they are impacted by uh, other than other sort of rays, but also heat and temperature, etc. So temperature has a direct impact or correlation onto resistance. Okay. So when we connect all of these things together, this is kind of the basic circuit um, that we're looking at in terms of getting these electrons flowing. Okay, so uh, what you'll find here is that we spoke about the first element. Um, whoops, I'm just going to quickly select a pen. Um, so this is basically um, a resistor, and this is the element here. Uh, or the, the, the sign or the symbol uh, for what a resistor would look like. Um, this here um, would represent the battery and this ultimately is your uh, representation of a cell. 
sometimes you'll find uh, you might even see that repeated a few times. So you might find something like this. Okay. Um, this this particular example basically means there are now three cells connected um, in series ultimately. Um, so what happens when we have a closed uh, circuit like this? We said that current starts to flow from the positive to the negative, right? They start spinning around in this particular direction. And the current flowing around is typically represented by the letter I, okay? And as we said, current is measured in amperes. All right. So um, this is sort of your, your basic um, circuit diagram. Uh, and some of you sort of move into digital electronics uh, school, et cetera. Um, I do believe that my other pearls at some point will be covering uh, certain elements around electronics, uh, Brittany. Um, and and you'll, you'll need to understand what these various different symbols uh, ultimately mean. Um, this little thing here at the bottom, um, which looks like three lines going to the bottom, and it is um, labeled as G and D, represents ground. And ground basically means negative, right? This is ultimately connected to the negative supply um, of the power supply itself. Um, and where, where we actually get the word ground from, you'll find that uh, in, in large transmission circuits, etc. Um, you would need to sort of um, provide um, a, a, a copper pipe that goes into the physical ground, right? And that's ultimately where the word ground uh, comes from. Now, there are two laws that uh, I very briefly want to cover. Um, the first one being Ohm's law and the second one being Kirchhoff's law, okay? Um, but I'll sort of cover that um, later on um, post we post this particular slide, which is covering elements of energy sources. So in terms of energy sources, um, we broadly categorize them in sort of two, two types, uh, non-renewable non type energy, and of course, uh, renewable energy, right? And you'll find that uh, a lot of us refer to as renewable energy as green uh, technology as well. So you'll find renewable energy is very, very closely um, related and falls under the, the ambit of SDG number seven, which relates to affordable and uh, clean energy. Um, so running through some of these different elements, you'll find that from a non-renewable perspective, um, there uh, are multiple sources, one being nuclear, where we use um, nuclear reactions that basically generate heat that then drives the generator and then creates power. Uh, you then, then have the options of, uh, of coal. And again, very, very similar process, uh, just like with oil and gas, where these are used as burning elements uh, that then create heat uh, and which then drives a generator ultimately. Um, the thing about um, you know, nuclear coal, oil, and natural gas is that you'll find that we refer to them as non-renewable. Um, because these are finite sources, uh, ultimately where they come from, right? Um, when compared to renewable energy, I'm sorry, the other thing around uh, non-renewable energy is that it has a very big, much larger carbon footprint um, when, when compared to, to the green technologies. Um, on the left-hand side, of course, um, there are a few elements here that most of you would be familiar with. Um, there would be solar energy, um, you know, so we'll, we'll cover elements of solar just now. Um, interestingly, there are, there's wave technologies as well, right? So we know that there's a natural phenomenon of wave movement in the oceans, and we've actually been able to harness um, the, the motion of, um, of the waves, et cetera, to, to ultimately generate power for us. Um, and for me, I think my, my favorite one um, in terms of the renewable energy standpoint would be wind. Um, here across the Western Cape, we have massive, massive wind farms located uh, um, across the coast and um, basically harnessing the energy of wind. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has any questions at this point or perhaps any comments that you'd like to share. Maybe tell us about your favorite type of energy, uh, perhaps.
So, so just while you, you're welcome at any point to pop that into the chat as well. Um, so how does power generation actually work, right? Um, so we spoke about the different types of, uh, of energy. So from a utilizing coal, um, as an example, at the very, very top, you'll find that typically we need to mine uh, for coal and we need to get it, get it out of the ground ultimately. We then take that through a pulverization sort of process and that's essentially making the coal uh, a little bit smaller and then a lot more finer. We then take um, those coal elements as a source of energy and burn it, right, in, in a furnace ultimately. Um, and then moving on to sort of this area here, I'm going to try this again. Uh, that area here is where we then start to have these, this little blue and red, red sort of line is essentially a pipe carrying water. Okay, um, and water sort of flows um, through this particular furnace and it heats up. And as it's heating up, it then generates um, steam, right? And the steam is then utilized um, to sort of drive a generator. Okay, now from a generation standpoint, um, this is actually making use of a phenomenon where we have a copper cable, okay, and we have power. When electricity starts to flow through, um, you know, a, a piece of cable, it then starts to create a magnetic field around it ultimately. Okay, so a lot of you would know this as the electromagnetic effect. Now, from a power generation perspective, um, the reverse of this becomes true as well, right? So if you have a conductor and we then introduce magnets, right, on either side of this, um, and we create that magnetic field, when you move a conductor through a magnetic field, it actually then starts to induce um, electricity, okay? And that's very, very basically how a generator operates. You have um, an, a conductor that's running through or breaking through magnetic field lines and ultimately then creating power, okay? And, and this is basically what gives us, um, I showed you very, very earlier on the waveform of uh, alternating current. It basically looks like this, okay? The motion of this particular waveform is directly related to how the generation of power is happening, right? You have, you essentially have a spindle that's spinning around through 360 degrees, cutting into the, um, the magnetic field and thereby generating current that's flowing in, in different directions, et cetera, okay? So once that power is coming through, uh, we then pass it into a transformer. So this initial transformer is called a step up transformer. It basically increases the voltage to around what kilovolts and, and, and megavolts sort of range um, for transmission across, across the countries, right? So this, this essentially here is the distribution network. Um, and you'll find these massive pylons scattered throughout the countryside, ultimately carrying our power uh, from one end to the other end. Um, before it gets into your home, we need to then take these high voltages, okay, transforming it downwards into a more manageable 220 volts, which then ultimately gets into your home, okay? So that again here is very, very high level in terms of what, uh, what happens here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of running through the slides, so please at any point, feel free to just ask a question, raise your hand, or pop in messages uh, on, on the chat group. And of course, my, my co-hosts are just sort of keeping a firm hand in terms of what's going on there. Um, Judy. Great. Colin, yes, thank you. I was wondering if um, we should just have a scheduled break for about 15 minutes or something, when it suits you, you know, around, kind of like around the top of the hour, um, just so that we can have a little bit of a leg stretch. Sure. Excellent. Um, we'll do so, Judy. I think yeah, I'm going to try and just wrap up on the power generation side and we'll break into a uh, session. Um, so, Essentially, then very quickly, um, we spoke about how your typical generators would work, but then what about a solar panel array, right? 
So again, uh, a lot of you might find, you might have some of these solar panels uh, up on your roof, uh, by, for example, or you might have actually noticed uh, at a farm uh, along the countryside, a whole field of these various different um, solar panel areas. Now, basically, um, solar panels work through a phenomenon called uh, photovoltaic um, electricity. What essentially happens is that there's a process um, of which there's a certain type of chemical within each of these solar panels. You have a whole bunch of photons finding its way from the sun. And when those, uh, those photons interact with the actual solar panel, it then generates a voltage, okay? And you'll find that the voltage coming out of a typical solar panel um, comes out in a DC voltage, right? So here again, drawing the, the waveform, it's gonna be a very, very fixed um, voltage coming out. So in some cases, this might be a three volt, uh, it might be a five volt, uh, you know, it might be a 12 volt, for example. So it's a whole range of configurations. Um, that then feeds into a little control unit called a charge controller. And the charge controller is essentially used to then store all of the energy that's been collected from the solar panels into a battery pack, okay? So here we actually find the real um, use behind batteries is that we use it also as an ability to store energy for use later on, okay? Um, so while these batteries are being charged um, by the charge controller, we also have the ability to use it, okay? However, for us to make use of in a typical household, so remember that here, um, we require 220 volts, okay, coming in. This particular device called the DC to AC inverter provides a mechanism of converting DC voltage into AC voltage, which we can plug straight into our household and start utilizing and consuming um, in quite, quite immediately, right? Um, and we're also finding that in some, in most instances where people have these installations um, um, available, they do have an excess amount of voltage available. So there are some parts of the world where they allow you then to take your excess um, energy through a meter and feed it into the electrical grid. And by doing so, they actually have an ability to earn money, okay? So I know here in South Africa, there are a few laws um, and a few sort of regulatory uh, hurdles to jump through before we can actually get to that point. Um, but, but certainly, you know, we're seeing that we might move into to an environment where all our homes will have a solar panel array sitting on the roof and we all might be selling power to ESCOM, who, who we know actually desperately needs, uh, needs some assistance there. Um, Let's just put this out of the way. Okay, so I think uh, perhaps, Julia, at this point, before we move into the satellites, satellite assemblies, et cetera, um, yeah, I think, I think it would be great if we break now. Um, what time do you think we, we could return? Uh, it's, yeah, it's four minutes to the hour. So should we say that we come back at 10 past? How about that? Fantastic. So it's the stuff that we've learned, um, how, how the stuff we've learned sort of comes together in terms of understanding a few, uh, two very basic laws um, of, of electricity, and then we'll sort of move into um, a discussion on satellites, etc. So I'm just quickly going to um, bring up my screen quickly. <clears throat> Okay, great. So um, we're going to jump straight into what's known as Ohm's law, right? So what Ohm's law uh, essentially talks about is the relationship amongst all these various different components that we have within a circuit. Um, but very basically, what Ohm's law states is that um, voltage um, is directly proportional to, to current, okay? So basically, more voltage will give you more current, uh, more current flow has a, a, a direct correlation to, to voltage. Um, and it also has an inverse um, um, relationship to, to resistance ultimately. So 
maybe just in terms of that as well, is that it allows us to relate um, the various aspects of these components together in the form of an equation. So the equation that you see uh, talking about um, Ohm's law down here is, whoops, so I'm just going to quickly change to pen. Um, is this as a fundamental? V is equal to I times R. Okay, so ultimately the voltage in the circuit is equal to the current flowing through that component multiplied by the resistance of that component. Okay, so basically we're saying that um, um, if we look at these elements, right? So here V is the power supply into this particular circuit. And of course, most importantly, we need to get the positive and the negative correct. When we close the circuit, we can expect a flow of current in that direction, right? And then of course, in that direction. Um, and then what we start to find is as the current flows through this resistor, it's actually going to start to drop a, a voltage um, across this resistor. So let's say, for example, this here, I'm going to replace this by um, FND. This is the symbol for an LED. So that LED that you saw earlier on, the little red dot, uh, you'll find if you look onto your, your kits, um, you'll find that on the board itself, there's a little blue LED. Okay, so it's essentially that, that same component. Um, ultimately. So when we attach the voltage to it, the light, the LED comes on. Um, and here's an inter interesting thing that happens. As electricity starts to flow through the circuit, there's a voltage drop across this element, right? So there's a certain amount of voltage that is dropped on it. So say, for example, this is five volts, okay? Uh, and it moves around in this particular direction. It then tends to drop um, so if it's dropping, um, take for example, two volts, depending on the resistor value, right? Let's, um, for example, assume it's gonna be a two volt drop across that component. Um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll find later on under Kirchhoff's law that these voltages will actually need to add up to the total source power voltage of about five volts. So if it's a source of five volts dropping two volts we can therefore expect a drop of three volts coming onto this particular um, um, LED. So if, if you are just like me and you want to see, well, where's the proof of all of this and where's the empirical evidence, et cetera, um, I think it's important for us to maybe just conduct a very, very quick experiment um, showing that Ohm's law is actually fairly accurate, right? The way we're going to do that is, again, I'm going to quickly jump back to my little makeshift um, makeshift desktop experiment. So let's just bring that down again. Uh, Colin, you're still sharing your screen. So your camera's time, sorry. Okay. So that's... Uh, is that better? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Oh, yes, okay, that is. So again, uh, pardon the mess on my desktop, folks, but uh, um, yeah, it's a very sort of makeshift sort of setup just ultimately to show you what's going on. So, so what I've done here um, very quickly is that you'll see um, I'm using this as my power source, okay? So I've got my positive and my negative coming onto this little de, um, piece of, of kit is called a breadboard. Um, and essentially a breadboard allows you to tinker around with these various different components and build stuff ultimately, right? So what I've got happening here is that I'm providing a positive volt, uh, voltage on the top there and providing a negative uh, voltage at the bottom there. Um, and again, you're know, using my uh, little diagnostic tool here. Uh, I'm gonna set this to volts which is going to show us what is the power voltage uh, being supplied to, to this breadboard. Okay. And as you can see, it's currently around about 5.09 volts coming in. Okay, so that's my input battery supply. Then I've got the circuit going through to this resistor. 
okay? Um, the unit of the resistor, I'm not sure, sure if I mentioned it earlier, is the ohm. Um, and you'll find that, uh, I've seen that a lot of you had conversations, um, you know, in the chat around the colors that you see on this resistor. Um, I'm sure in a later module as well, you, you will be exposed to what these colors mean and how to determine the value of it. So this particular one is exactly one kilo ohm, which is basically 1000 ohms. So it's providing a resistance of 1000 ohms into the circuit. So we've got the positive power supply coming in there, going through the resistor. Uh, it's then running through into this LED, which you can see is currently on, okay? So my question is, if I'd like to test um, the equation V equals I times R, or voltage is equal to the current times the resistance, okay? The way I'm gonna do that is, I know from, from Ohm's law that within the circuit, the current at any point should actually be exactly the same, right? So if I measure the current at that point, it should be the same at that point, and it should be the same at this point. So current anywhere on that loop will actually be exactly the same. Now, I mentioned that on the resistor, as you're applying the voltage across this, there's a certain amount of voltage that will drop across this resistor, and there will be another remaining voltage that drops across this LED, right? So using the equation, if I measure the voltage drop across that, and I know the resistance, okay, I should be able to figure out what is the um, the actual current itself. So firstly, let's, let's measure the voltage drop across this resistor here. So I've got the set at, um, into my voltmeter, and I'm going to connect now into the resistor. Okay, and you'll see, I hope, um, that it's recording somewhere around about 3.2, 3.3 volts as a voltage drop across that, okay? Um, so at this point, I just quickly want to bring up the um, presentation again and the formula. And I'd like one of you to do a very quick calculation for me based on this. Um, right. So we we know here that, um, let's just set this up here back to the pen. Uh, I showed you, we measured five volts as the power supply coming in, right? Um, in terms of the resistor, I mentioned to you that it is 1,000 ohms, right? And then I also showed you that I measured around about 3.2 volts recorded across this particular resistor. And the other thing that I, I also pointed out that current, uh, which is represented by I, okay, here, would be exactly the same at that point. I there will be exactly the same at that point, I there, right? Because it's basically flowing in the single sort of circuit loop. So how do we then calculate I, right? We've got R and we've got V. I want to calculate I flowing through this. So anybody would like to shout out, raise your hand up. Oh, very quick to the draw, Tafara. Can you tell us, help us through this? How do we figure out, how do we calculate the current flowing through the resistor? So P equals I times V, right? Um, actually, if you could rather, rather use this equation. For... Okay, rather use that equation. Yeah. Okay, so. We know our V is V is five, and yes. we know our R is it's thousand ohms. So we take uh, the thousand over, so it becomes five over thousand equals I. Okay, great. So essentially, what what you've done here, uh, maybe one small step backward, Tafara, is, and you've obviously done this mentally very, very quickly, right? We want to basically take this equation, and we want to solve. We've got V, and we've got R, and we want to solve for I. So all we need to do is rearrange the equation that solves for I. And the way we do that, obviously, is that we can then 
if we divide this side of the equation with R, R and R cancels out. Whatever we do on that side, we need to do on this side. We divide that by R. We're then left with I. And therefore, I is equal to B over R, which you've, like I said, you've done that very quickly mentally. Um, and, um, and, and also you'll end up with a W. Now, the only slight correction that I want to make uh, to, to what you mentioned so far is the voltage. Remember, we're not using the voltage across the power supply because there's a voltage drop that we measured across the resistor, all right? So a lot of us get caught with this uh, in the exams ultimately. Um, so Tafari, I see you put your hand raised up again. You, you want to try a quick correction to this. Um, may you please repeat that and I'll get it. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so essentially you are correct in terms of figuring out the, the, the equation. Uh, I is equal to V over R. But remember that because I is the same anywhere in the circuit, um, and it doesn't quite matter. So either what does matter is because we're talking about the thousand ohm resistor, okay, here. Yes. We have to then utilize the voltage recorded in relation to the resistor. Okay, so therefore the voltage that we're going to use is the one that we measured across the resistor, which is 3.2. Correct, right? It's basically 3.2 yes. and not the main power supply as well, right? Yes. So if you take 3.2 divided by a thousand, that's 0.0. Um, 0 Zero three two. Zero and a zero three two. Is that correct in terms of? Uh, you, you're missing a zero column a zero. of the. Yeah, there should be a zero where you. Yeah. Excellent. All right, excellent. So, so essentially, it should be a zero comma zero three two, and the value is amps. Now, obviously. Um, it's a strange number, right? To 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 utilize and to basically toss around. So what we what we do is we convert this into a sub multiple, um, and what we can do, for example, is we can multiply this value by a thousand again, by a thousand, and it will come back to three point two. But instead of an amps, we'll call it milli. Okay, and that's where we sort of get. So that's a little bit messy at the bottom there, but that's kind of what we think I is equal to throughout the circuit, 3.2 milliamps, okay? So back to the, um, back to the experiment. Um, let's, let's double check uh, Tafara's thinking um, and if that is actually indeed correct. So let me go back here. Okay, just uh, first, can, can um, Judy and Brittany, can you confirm that you can see uh, the workshop desk? And I'm, I'm yes. Stop share now. Okay, cool. There we go. Okay, so, so, so folks, we've got five volts coming in. We've got three point two volts dropping across the resistor. We've got it flowing through into the LED. Now, when you're measuring voltages, you notice that I went and measured across, so basically in parallel to to the actual component, right? To give me a certain value. But when you measure current, you've got to measure it in series um, to the circuit. So I've got to break the circuit and connect my meter in between, right, in line with it. So first, I'm going to change the meter to measure current. Okay, I'm going to place it there. And I've actually placed it on the milliamp scale, all right, because we are expecting a milliamp answer, ultimately. I'm going to now break the circuit. When I break the circuit, you'll see the LED goes off. And I'm going to connect my multimeter in series with it. The light comes on. And we're measuring around about 3.19, around about 3.2-ish. All right, I hope you can all see that. Okay, so what the meter is telling me is that it is actually physically measuring 3.2 milliamps. Okay. Um, and then just sort of jumping back to our calculations here. Okay, 
Okay, so I think I think you'll you'll all agree that we we calculated we're expecting around about 3.2 milliamps, and as we've done in the actual um, measurements, is also 3.2 milliamps. So I think we can believe that uh, that this law actually applies, right? So it's a very very cool uh, law that helps us to calculate, and this ultimately is used in in terms of designing um, circuits, etc. The other element that we need to sort of be um, aware of is something called Kirchhoff's law. Um, you know, in terms of how do all these currents, um, how do we figure out um, the calculations of current coming into a point and leaving a point, and also in terms of the voltage um, sort of calculation there as well. Uh, at this point, I think I'd like to bring on uh, Brittany, who's uh, kindly offered to maybe show you a graphic specifically around uh, Kirchhoff's law to help with that understanding. So, uh, Brittany. Then, uh, just stop sharing. I will share my screen. So, uh, I offered to talk about this because this is particularly something that tripped me up in first year and that's first year not just at school and it's something that you guys are doing before even university so Kirchhoff's law um, he has three laws but we are going to be looking at maybe two so his voltage law and his current law the vector sum so that's all of it of all of the voltages in one direction around a closed loop is zero. So when we talk about the closed loop, we mean when the circuit is closed. So we all know how switches work. Uh, a switch will be what opens or closes the circuit. When the switch is open, it's an open loop. When the switch is closed, it's a closed loop. So all of the voltages going in one direction, so in any specific direction, whether it be clockwise or anti-clockwise, they will amount to zero when the circuit is closed. But when it's open, that's a different story. And then the current law, essentially the vector sum of all the currents entering and leaving a junction is zero. So when you have things going to a specific point where there are branches, we'd call it a junction, as you can see in the diagram here. So all of the currents going to it will amount to zero when it exits the junction. So the vector sum is all of the quantities have both magnitude and direction. As you know from physics, you'll know that uh, scalar quantity will be just magnitude, so that's just size, but it's a vector when it has direction and size. Um, and then voltages will either be positive or negative, depending on which side is more positive. So when we look at that, we usually use the positive and negative terminals of the power source. And then whether we move up, up or down across the voltage as we pass in our chosen direction. So traditionally speaking, we'd always move to, from the positive to the negative in, in loops. But there are times when you'd move in the opposite direction, it would obviously be case to case for specific applications. And then currents will either be positive or negative, depending on whether they are entering or leaving the junction. Usually for current law, we'll um, say that the charges entering are positive and then the charges exiting are negative. That's essentially what Kirchhoff's law is. And we usually apply it when looking at circuits, when we're looking at designing like power systems and how they will work as a whole, when we're looking at all of the things that those power systems need to actually use to the power for a specific system. So in a satellite, the things like the tracking and telemetry will take power, the CMDH, so the core will take power, the main brain, and then also the power system itself that controls the power in terms of satellites, like Colin's going to talk about later, um, possible solar power and solar tracking, that also takes power, so we account for that, and that's when we would use Kirchhoff's law. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Brittany. So, so certainly, um, you know, we, we actually allow uh, oh, quite a bit uh, to these wonderful physicists, right? They've actually gone through the process of determining the relationships of, of current uh, and voltages, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe just to, um, oops, let's just, uh, sorry. 
So I've just lost my window for a second. Just to recap uh, exactly what Brittany had covered. So going back to this really, really messy uh, sort of page ultimately, um, in terms of what uh, Brittany spoke about is that you have um, the two laws that you covered, uh, that you spoke about was one was the relative to current, right? Basically all the currents that enter a particular point, okay, would equal to the current coming out, right? So that, if that is sort of an I1, um, that's an I2, and then it's an I3. So let's say that is 10 milliamps, 10 milliamps, 10 milliamps, the total current coming out from that point will amount to 30 milliamps, okay? So interestingly here, this, this particular circuit is just a single loop, okay, that we have in place. However, if we had introduced a second sort of resistor that comes in there, okay, we now find that Kirchhoff's law will apply from a current perspective. So we have 3.2 milliamps entering this particular point here. We'll find that it will split itself up into a proportion of 3.2 milliamps and it'll split that up. So now if we have the same resistor, for example, on that side, you'll find that then the current moving in that direction would be uh, 1.6 milliamps, okay? The current coming down in that direction would be 1.6 milliamps. So that's what basically what Kirchhoff's law means from a current perspective. From a voltage perspective, we've also covered it here. We mentioned that in a closed loop circuit like this, the voltages also will start to drop, but the total voltage, which is five volts, will equal to the sum of all the voltage drops in terms. So we measured a 3.2 volts um, dropped across there, and therefore the, the voltage being dropped across the LED will be equal to five minus 3.2. Uh, so that, that's really ultimately what, um, what Brittany covered in terms of the Kirchhoff's law element. So we've covered quite a bit in terms of, of the theory, et cetera, and, uh, you know, we're going to get to a point where I'd like to have a discussion around all the various different uh, theory elements, but very quick application um, of um, specifically solar panels is with these two wonderful um, Intel set specific satellites, right? These are communications that are satellites that basically are sent to spin around uh, the world to facilitate uh, communications. One at the bottom here, I think, is um, IS-16, um, if I'm not mistaken. And it facilitates satellite um, communications from one part of the world to the other part of the world. But I think in our, in our next follow-up conversation around connectivity, et cetera, we will talk about how do we communicate uh, from one point of the world to the other side of the world? And also, you know, more interestingly, how do we enable interplanetary communications? How do we communicate, right, from Mars, for example, back to, to Earth, et cetera? But what I wanted to cover here was essentially you'll find that there are two methods um, in terms of how solar panels specifically are utilized uh, on, on these satellites. Now on the top, you'll find that we have a body mounted um, um, a solar array, right? So ultimately you have solar panels stuck onto the side of the actual um, unit itself. And then at the bottom, you have a sun tracking array, which is sort of uh, sort of split out onto the wings. Um, and you'll find that they have a capability of tracking and locating the sun and sort of pointing directly at the sun. Because obviously we know that um, we have the, the best power efficiency, the best power being derived, um, the, 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 you know, the more the, the actual arrow is pointing at the sun, the greater the power efficiency ultimately. Okay. Um, and then here again, uh, it's, it's also, uh, you know, thanks to, to my colleague, uh, Brittany, she shared some of her notes with this particular organization where this covers uh, some of the aspects that we've learned from a solar array perspective and also combine what you've now learned from a Kirchhoff's law perspective, right? So a lot of these areas you'll find tend to have the ability, they, they are typically rated at a specific voltage and they're also rated at a specific maximum current that they can actually produce. Um, however, you'll find that the equipment uh, that we send up into a particular module um, may require a lot more 
than what an individual um, solar um, panel could, could generate. So what we then do is utilizing what we know from a Kirchhoff's uh, law perspective. So on the on your left hand side, you've got two arrows connected in um, in series. And from what we've what we've learned uh, with batteries connected in series, right? It's very similar to what happens to connecting solar arrays um, in series. When we're now connecting them in, in series, we notice that the voltage coming out, the VT, is actually equal to um, V1 plus V2. So we now have the ability to create whatever voltage we want by adding in series uh, a number of these different solar arrays. Okay, and you'll find that although that um, the arrays are connected in series, we'll still find that the current flowing through them will always be the same. So the total I into this particular circuit will still be the I flowing through the solar panel at the bottom, and it will still be equal to the I in the solar panel flowing through the top. Okay, and again, these are elements of of Kirchhoff's law. Looking at the panel arrangement with the array on the top right hand side, you'll find that these two arrays are not connected in parallel. Okay. Um, so basically, we find that here in this instance, the V total will actually be the same, all right, as V. Um, but our current coming out of this particular uh, configuration, again, using Kirchhoff's law, IT is equal to the I1 plus I2, all right? Um, and then, of course, at the bottom, um, the bottom right, you'll see that there are a whole range of arrays that we can now start to create depending on what our solar module, um, our satellite module requires in terms of voltage and what it requires in terms of current, we can design an array that gives us exactly what um, um, voltage and current conf configuration is required in this instance. Okay. Um, so moving on into the actual system functions and, and I have to say Brittany threw a few three letter um, abbreviations that were completely over my head, right? And that you start to realize where they come into play here. So on a typical solar uh, satellite configuration, there's a whole range of different modules that you find. So in this particular example, very broadly, you have the power supply modules and you have the power conditioning and distribution modules, okay? From a power supply perspective, it pulls the power from the solar panels, starting on the left-hand side um, here. Um, and then whatever power, so whether it's a certain V and there's a certain I that's generated from these panels, it goes into the control section, okay? And if you recall, uh, I spoke about a charge controller that's required in a solar panel sort of configuration, which manages what amount of power is stored. And then of course, what amount of power is then delivered into the circuits that require um, to, to consume it. Um, the voltage regulation is essentially a really key element of the circuits that ensures that whatever voltage is being produced stays constant. So for example, if we're expecting nine volts coming out there at all times, the voltage regulation um, sort of module ensures that even if there's a slight fluctuation, right, we might see um, eight volts at some, at some times, we might see it go down even to five volts, um, there might be instances where it goes up to 12 volts, okay? And, 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 and of course, these variations could be quite catastrophic to components and sensors that you have sitting on the satellite, right? And therefore, this particular module becomes hugely, hugely um, important. Um, and then, of course, here, the next section, you said you would have a protection circuit that ensures that we are then protecting um, the different elements, et cetera, against fluctuations in voltages. Um, and then, of course, this element is distribution. Throughout the actual um, satellite uh, module assembly, we then just need to distribute power that needs to go through. Um, we um, Brittany spoke about the tracking array, all right? So there are some elements that require, they need to ultimately track the sun. We then need to send power to the main core processing units. We then need to send it to the Sort of actuators, right? And these are ultimately the motors, uh, uh, essentially. But you'll also find that in parallel, we have a similar sort of setup 
um, going through multiple other parts of the um, of the satellite, uh, and you find it repeated here. Okay, so having a look at um, the actual um, modules that come as part of the the Max IQ STEM kits, you'll find that there's a very very deliberate design uh, in terms of it. Right, so every module looks like a little square block. Uh, and they look like a block like this. Um, and you'll find that they have a connector that connects from one side to the other side. And you also find quite key is that they have this ability on four sides of it in, in most instances, right? Uh, I think this basically covered here on the next slide. Um, so here again, you'll find that these little, um, little, little things are actually connectors. All that they do is that you'll find, if you look at any particular module, on every single module, you'll find that there are just one, two, three, and four strips. And you'll find that repeated on all different sides of the actual um, module itself. Now, essentially what these four little strips are, there are very two important aspects that they cover here. Um, the one side is the power, okay, which is basically your plus and your minus, five volts, okay? And the other two is basically your signaling, okay? Um, and, and these two, um, you know, if, if some of you are interested, it uses a protocol uh, called R squared C. Um, you know, at a, a later stage, we could probably delve into exactly what that is. But basically, it provides the basic communication bus for this module to talk to that module, that module to talk to that module, and for that to talk to that, which is why these connectors are very important because it's transmitting power as well as the signaling aspect from one module to the other, to the other module ultimately. Okay. Um, so in a, in a sense, what we've done here is that we're power is coming in at this point, right? Which is your, your um, USB connector. And using these connectors, we've actually built a circuit that is ultimately going around this uh, entire sort of assembly, uh, ensuring that this five volts being delivered to all of the devices. Now you'll also find that uh, this particular type of setup, as you've seen with the previous diagram, provides for some level of redundancy. Okay. So redundancy is basically an element that's required where if for some reason this particular component breaks down, right? And then and the circuit strips are, are broken for whatever instance. We find that power still has a different route to get to this particular model, module. If we have a secondary failure, let's say on that also, okay? Those two elements break. We still continue to receive power and signaling through this particular um, side. And of course, I mean, this is hugely important when we send um, these types of kits and modules up into space where millions of dollars are spent in terms of getting this kit up into space. And if we have a failure for some, whatever reason to that particular component or that particular area, we would still like um, the entire sort of module or assembly to continue to, to function, okay? Um, the one question I ask here is, um, you know, firstly, is the circuit closed? Absolutely, right? We know that there's a lot of connectivity happening going around the circuit. How does the power circulate? I think we've answered um, in terms of these little connections that are hugely important in terms of not just distributing the power uh, throughout the entire circuit, but also the signaling aspects uh, that we could utilize our sensors, et cetera. And the third one is around, so where are the components, right? So the components that I showed you earlier on look very different to what you find on, on these particular boards. And that's because they have sort of these tiny little elements here and it's called a surface mount device, okay? They are sort of miniaturized to a certain extent that we have resistors in here that are so tiny that you probably can't see it. Uh, you know, so these little blocks here, for example, those little blocks are uh, potentially resistors or they could be capacitors, which is another component you might actually learn about later on. Uh, and this little thing here as well is your, your LED, right? Uh, so you'll see it here as well, which is also your LED. Uh, but these are sort of fancier LEDs which have the capability of um, producing multicolors, right? So it's an RGB um, LED. 
which has the capability of producing any combination of those three odds. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, we have just sort of 10 minutes remaining. Um, I wanted to get into a whole bunch of questions, which I think we'll, we'll leave towards uh, the end as an assignment for you to complete uh, during the week. And these are all questions relating to talking about your, uh, your Ohm's law and your Kirchhoff's law and sort of allowing you the ability to sort of apply that uh, from a theoretical perspective. Um, and you'll find that here we'll also talk about what are the various different elements learning what you've learned in terms of power generation, power sources, uh, how we actually make that available uh, for a habitat on, on Mars, etc. We can then sort of chat about a little, little around uh, that just now. But before we get into that discussion, um, in terms of the actual uh, assignment, etc., um, you know, so if, if you could also have a look at your kit and, and try to determine what is the minimum configuration required, right, in terms of your, your kit, um, for it to just talk to the Kibana um, dashboard. Do you require all of these elements that you see uh, right here? Or if, can you actually go down to a minimum um, combination of these modules? And secondly, you know, what, what do you think is the most number of modules you can sort of piece together based on all the different bits and pieces you received in your kit? What do you think is the most number of modules that you can, you can actually uh, connect together? I'd also like you to, to also think about um, power consumption, right? Do, do you think that by adding on additional modules, it starts to utilize um, a lot more power? Um, and, and then by uh, the corollary to that, you know, by utilizing the minimum amount of modules, do you think there's a reduced uh, impact on battery consumption? And then finally, in terms of the actual ex experiment, if, if, you, um, if you have access to a, um, a battery module of some sort, uh, right, or a cell phone charger of some sort that you could plug into the kits and do a, do a little test, right? So try connecting the minimum number of modules possible until your battery runs down. And basically measure the time that it takes from the time you, you've connected it up until the point where you find that your, your data is not being reported onto the Kibana dashboard. And then repeat the experiment with a fully charged battery again, but this time with all the different elements and modules you, you can connect into, uh, into the kit. And again, time from the point that you, you connect it up until the time it runs down and see if there's a difference in terms of the time that it takes um, for it to ultimately die down. Okay, so welcome to share any questions that you have on that particular assignment and on the questions. I think we'll post this onto the canvas um, that, that Judy has created. Um, but I think, yeah, I'd like to maybe just spend the last remaining couple of minutes to run through um, maybe just a quick reflection in terms of uh, uh, a lot of the theory that we've covered uh, throughout the entire sort of conversation. Um, some reflection on some of the experimentation that we saw what stands out for, uh, for you from the power generation and sources of power. And then of course, you know, how would some of this apply to uh, the Mars uh, habitat in terms of the mega assignment uh, that we've been, we've been chatting about? So yeah, I think uh, perhaps at this point I'd like to then pause for comments and questions. Farah, yes, uh, you've put your hand up. So um, I remember uh, when you started your presentation, right? You, in the presentation, there was a picture of an atom. And what struck me on that picture was how it resembled the solar system. And I wanted to ask, is there any link between how an atom looks like and the solar system and before you answer the question i also have this fact because the proton and the neutron which make up the nucleus of the atom is the majority of the atoms actually the at, uh, the mass of the atom and if you look at the 
because it resembles from what I want to think of it, it resembles the sun, that protons and the atoms and the electrons resemble the planets. And the sun also takes about 99.8 of the weight in the solar system. So is there any type of correlation or is it just a coincidence? Oops, that's a fantastic question, Tafara. And, and I was wondering, you know, if that would actually come up. Um, but but I think, you know, from, from my perspective, um, I'm not certain that there is a direct uh, correlation between the two. It just happens to be the case. But perhaps if uh, one of my colleagues would like to maybe take that, uh, take that question, I'll see Milena, uh, if you would like to share some of your insights. Uh, yes, uh, Tafara, that is a very good observation. It has to do with the law of uh, Coulomb for uh, attraction of um, the electrical charges, which is uh, reverse proportionate to the distance from the um, between the charges, and the law of gravity, which is directly proportionate. Uh, sorry, reverse proportionate to the distance between the planets and the objects. So the law of um, of Coulomb uh, about electrical charges and the law of gravity about the different masses of traction, uh, very similar uh, in connection to the uh, indirect proportionality, uh, sorry, reverse proportionality to the square of the distance. That's why. Great, thanks for that, uh, Melena. Uh, Judy, you've got your hand up. Great, Colin, yes, thank you. Uh, Tafara, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, well spotted and excellent question. Um, when I studied when I studied physics and when I studied chemistry at university, we learned a lot of, in physics about uh, the nuclear laws uh, and nuclear interactions. And, um, and then in chemistry, we also learned a lot about the orbitals around the atoms and then how how, uh, uh, how uh, chemical bonds work, because you get a chemical bond when two atoms start sharing orbitals uh, amongst their electrons, um, and then it actually creates these bonds. So the thing is that um, Newton was fantastic for his time. Um, you know, he was, he was uh, you know, uh, around kind of like the, the, the 1600s, and, um, or the 1500s, actually. Uh, and, uh, and so the thing is that his theories were great when it comes to large objects that we can observe. But as soon as we started, we were able to observe um, uh, objects on the atomic level, uh, on the nucleus level, uh, etc. cetera. Then uh, Newton's laws started to break down and they couldn't apply. Uh, and so that is why um, the whole uh, field of nuclear physics uh, came about uh, in the early um, 1900s. Uh, so in the early 20th century, uh, we started seeing scientists being uh, starting to solve those challenges. So uh, what it was is that they were going more towards what we refer to as unified laws of physics, which would then apply at the atomic level, as you can see, you know, in terms of the electrons orbiting uh, a nucleus, um, and uh, and all the way through to what actually happens with with planets in solar systems, um, but also how do stars and solar systems then um, orbit uh, at orbit um, black holes or centers of galaxies? Um, how is it that uh, our universe is expanding, um, and so everything is moving away from everything else? Uh, in space around us. So, so uh, our current challenge is that um, we've, we have this we have this great unified theory, um, which applies right from the atomic level all the way up to literally the universal level. Um, our challenge is that if we consider the actual point of the Big Bang, uh, none of those theories apply. So, uh, the great minds on the planet are now working on how can we actually have a new theory 
that could also uh, incorporate that. So yes, absolutely. It's the, the same, the, the laws of physics, it's only, it's only accepted as a law of physics if we can apply it to uh, different levels in terms of, of our universe. Fantastic. I'm sure we can actually spend a lot more time just uh, you know, philosophizing on, on that uh, aspect alone. Um, are there any other reflections or comments uh, or questions? Sorry, Colin. I just want to elaborate on what Judy said. Of course, she's uh, correct that with the quantum physics, the atom atomic module is much more complicated than what we see in school representations. The electrons don't really circle like the planets around the uh, around the nucleus. They actually have uh, some specific area where we can find them with some certainty, and uh, that, that's where the law of uncertainty comes through. But uh, the biggest part of my explanation was that um, in general, um, the general representation was a circle around some center, and that representation is a simple equation inverse proportion is to a distance. With electrons, it's not that simple anymore, as Judy said, but I think that answers the first question. Excellent. I think then perhaps with that, um, um, from, from my side, it's been really awesome engaging with yourselves and, and sharing uh, some of this theory with you. And I see there's been a lot of conversation uh, on, on the chat groups and uh, yeah, thank you for, for interacting there and, of course, to my co-hosts um, for responding very, very timely to me. So uh, perhaps, yeah, it's, it's really thank you for my side and maybe just uh, off to, to Judy. Oh, great, Colin, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Reza, I can see that you're very active in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering if you wouldn't want to raise your hand um, and actually come on, come into the room and uh, you're, you're talking about a lot of really great things in terms of satellites and habitats on Mars. Uh, hi, everyone. Okay, so what I was saying in the, uh, the chat for my first uh, question there, I said so far habitat on Mars in terms of solar panels, would we have to have a solar array that needs to follow the path of the sun so that we can have the most power in a battery. And my second question there was, I also have a question with uh, satellites. When there are a lot of satellites in orbit, what is it that is stopping them from accidentally crashing into each other or passing the space station? But um, but the end of the I've answered that question very nicely. Yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic, uh, Reza. So, so just in terms of the, and I like the fact that you connect back into, you know, what, what do we do when we have a habitat uh, deployed onto Mars? Um, absolutely, we have equipment. We're going to require um, carbon scrapers. We're going to require machines that help us generate uh, oxygen. We're going to require, we spoke about, I think, in previous sessions around comfort levels, um, you know, within the, the, the habitat itself. And of course, maintaining comfort levels here, whether it's oxygen and it's humidity and it's temperature, et cetera, we would require a proper so, so there's a lot of the best requirement for energy. And of course, the one way to do that is through solar arrays uh, going across uh, uh, the, the planet or specifically in that area that's required. So, um, so definitely it'll have to be uh, uh, tracking uh, based solar arrays. The idea is that we want to ensure we're grabbing as much sunlight as, as possible. Um, but also, you know, bear in mind that there'll be certain, certain times where it will be nightfall, right? And uh, so what happens during the night when there's no, uh, no, no photons available at that particular point? Um, maybe just to respond to that, uh, uh, you know, from an answer perspective would be, well, we store the energy and that's what we use the batteries for. We need to have a very really well connected uh, battery uh, um, area as well it's, it has the ability to now store uh, power generated during the daylight and then of course distribute that back into the um, um, into the, the habitat during the night as well 
But, you know, so over and above that, uh, and I'll also be quite keen to hear what some of you think about other sources of energy, you know, uh, is wind available? Uh, for, for example, do we have um, other sort, forms of bio uh, methods available, etc.? So it'd be really great to hear, oh, would, there, would there be other um, forms of power in addition to, to solar? Colin, if I can come in here as well, just in terms of in terms of wind power. Um, yeah, I mean, we could certainly have tidal power. There are a number of places and on the ocean. Uh, if one has a, a very um, calm, <laughs> a calm, like for example, on the Mediterranean Sea or some of those inland seas, uh, like the, the Red Sea uh, and the Black Sea, et cetera, um, then they can certainly have tidal um, uh, power. Uh, and really what that is, is that as the, as the tide comes in, uh, it you know, turns the turbines one way and then it turns it another way as it goes out. We can also have wave power generation. Um, our challenge on, uh, uh, on the South African coast is that our, our waves are, can be very vicious. And so what they do is that they just shred any kind of equipment we try to put in there. Um, and also um, where we are in Scarborough, um, our wind is very gusty. So our neighbors put up this beautiful wind generator. And within two weeks, it was just, it was shredded as well because the, it wasn't a constant wind that was blowing. It was doing this the whole time. It was gusting, you know. So, um, so yeah, we, we really need to, we need to uh, collect data over a long, long period of time to see would we be able to harness that, it, it, that energy if efficiently and effectively, um, you know, what would be the wear and tear on our on our equipment? You know, so so the thing is that what you'll find is that uh, wind farms are usually, um, if it's close to one of our large oceans on our planet, they'll be slightly inland where the wind can be more predictable. Um, and also far away from sea spray, which is going to be really the, the rust, it'll, it'll rust anything, it'll rust aluminium and all of that kind of thing. Um, and also if we have a look at, uh, I certainly know if we take, for example, Denmark, which is really actually a series of, of islands, they have got a lot of wind farms, um, even out in the sea, they have wind farms. And when the wind is blowing, they sell electricity to most of their neighbors in the Scandinavian countries because they are a net positive green power producer. So they have shut down all of their other power stations. They rely on solar and wind power um, and they actually sell it. So they create a revenue uh, for their country. Um, and they have no, and they, they don't have the, that carbon footprint that comes with, with using oil or gas uh, or coal and stuff like that. So, so yeah, there's, uh, there's, where, where there's energy, we need to look at harvesting it. Uh, if anything's moving, it's because it's got energy. If anything's getting hot, it's because there's energy. If it's making a noise, there's energy. Right. If I just can hop in there with Riza's question for um, possible um, ways that they could generate energy in their Mars habitat. Um, think about other forms of chemical and movement energy that you might have access to in your Mars habitat. So um, if you think about um, how you're going to be treating water and holding water in your Mars habitat, that could possibly also be a, a source of energy if you look at um, some of the energy um, green sources that um, Colin showed in his presentation. And then also, are there any other forms of chemical energy that would be found in your Mars habitat just because it's used for other things? And I think also, um, you know, the, the humble potato, uh, you know, just something from, from that, that, apart from just the other um, tons and tons of general uses for it, um, you know, the one element that we probably didn't go through was um, just generating electricity from, from potatoes, generating electricity from lemons. Uh, some of you may have played around, right, with a lemon clock or a potato clock. Um, 
you know, so there's, there's, this, there's a potential application as well for, uh, for chemical needs. Uh, um, the other side as well, I think uh, from a hydrogen perspective, there's a very, very big play in terms of, uh, I know we've been engaging with a company called Sassol, um, and they're looking at um, utilizing hydrogen uh, as a really, really big um, um, source of, 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 of energy. Um, and the really nice thing about uh, hydrogen is it's part of the fuel cell technology, uh, a byproduct uh, of, of generating electricity through means of hydrogen is H2O, right? So uh, that's a really great, um, great option to, to potentially consider um, as one of those. Are there any other comments uh, or reflections from anybody? Um, Judy. Right, Colin, thank you very, very, very much. Uh, we have had a question on whether it would be possible to um, share the slides, um, if that would be okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you once again. And uh, also to everybody, uh, I'm not sure if you've seen um, the announcement that I've put on um, Canvas uh, recently is that uh, certainly for the, the schools in Rwanda, um, uh, everyone's going into exam time. So what I've done is for those assignments that are still due, I've extended uh, those due dates uh, a, a little bit so that everybody has a little bit more time to get to those. Um, the, the mega assignment and the group's assignments don't, don't move. So that is terrific. Um, good. Colin, once again, thank you very much. Milena, Nico, Brittany, thank you very much for your support. Um, and uh, as well as to all of, all of the participants who've really made incredible contributions, uh, Tafara, Reza, uh, Kareen, um, <laughs> Ruby, Declan, well, the, the list is long. So if I've missed anybody, please, it's, it's not personal. So great. Um, we will, we'll see you all next week. And uh, thank you once again, uh, over and out uh, from us. Thanks, Judy. Thanks all. Bye-bye.